Hi, I'm Todd Nock. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So, um, hopefully you saw the pencil video I did for this uh, Spider-Man villain, the Scorpion, on this amazing Fantasy 15 uh, sketch cover. So, if you haven't seen it, it's here on my channel. Give that a look. And um, we're just going to just jump right into the inks. I'll share some of my tips and tricks on how I approach my inks, and hopefully that'll help you in your inks for your illustrations. And if you're not here to really learn about art, but just to watch, because you like to watch people draw, so glad you're here. Let's uh, flip the camera around, let's get to work, and let's have some fun. All right, so here is the uh, sketch cover, and what I'll be using to ink with, or what I usually use to ink most all my pieces, professionally and for commissions and for fun, Pigma Micron pens, the 08, um, which is the thickest nib, down to the 01, the 005, and if for teeny tiny details, if necessary, the 003. Um, I might be using my zebra brush print pens, the medium and the fine points here, possibly, and I'll definitely be using the Pentel Pocket Brush Pen, especially for filling in some more of the, the larger black areas. So, um, Let's, let's just get started. So um, I like to work with stuff in the foreground. So the, 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 the tip of the tail and the stinger here, and then probably his head, hands, and then work towards the rest of his body. And uh, so let's kind of just uh, zoom in here a little bit on, so you can see more of the detail as I go. And um, because the, the tail here is, more of a technological type shape, uh, I like to use my drafting tools. So we're gonna use the French curve here to get some really nice clean curves uh, for a nice steady line. So I just find the curve on the French curve that matches up with the curve or the portion of the curve I want to ink using the 08 micron here. And then just do a nice, well, fairly thick line, so I'm, I'm doubling up the line here, so this really pops into the foreground. I'm going to turn the piece, I'm going to work on the next part of the stinger, finding the curve that fits for that line that I, I need to ink. Getting a nice built up thick line. And I can do the other other side of the stinger. You don't have to hit the curve all in one shot. Sometimes you have to break up the curve into sections depending on the shape of the curve and the the, the fr French curve or French curves that you have. So sometimes if it's a big long odd shaped curve, sometimes I have to hit it in certain chunks that work with the French curve shape to make it then one, one consistent line that I build in three or four moves, for lack of a better term. I flip the curve around to find that right curve angle. Sometimes I have to experiment with different parts of the French curve to see which curve actually fits the best. I think I liked this one better. Still using the 08, but not giving as much pressure for a nice thinner line. So thicker for the contours, thinner for the center there, creates some nice depth. And now for this other side of the of the, the tail. I'm going to hit this in two different curved chunks. So this just this far, building up that line, want to have that consistency of thickness. A little, it's a little thicker on this side, just subtly, because it's further away from the light source if we assume light is coming from above. Then so just a little bit thicker. And then this outer portion here, just find the right curve angle that I need, and starting from where I left off, and then pulling up to the top there, just a little bit thinner. Just 
finish off the main bit there. Sometimes I'll go a little freehand, just that last little bit there. That's okay. And while we're working with the French curve, let's just go ahead and do the whole tail that arcs all the way around behind the logo to his shoulder here. The nice thing is I don't have to do the whole line through there because it's I don't want the line to go over the, the text, so it's going to fall behind the text. So I just need as much of the curve that conveys what we see. So it's easy just to adjust as I go, but still trying to make sure I'm keeping in mind the flow is still steady, even though it's falling behind the text there. I don't want to have just mismatched lines. I want the lines to line up as, as, uh, as best as possible. Now for the bottom side, it's going to be a bit of a thicker line because the bottom is further away from the light. So a thicker line will convey a subtle shadow and help me create that depth that I'm looking for. So the line would be a little thinner on the top part of the, the object, a little thinner, or a little thicker, I should say, thinner on the top, thicker on the bottom. I can get that thickness just by pressing down more firmly as, as I ink to get that um, thicker line, just applying more pressure to the nib. The nib is that little black part right there. It's a term we use there. Then uh, just a re-angle. Now let the line just get a little bit thinner because it's now curving towards the bottom is now becoming the top. And this side will be the bottom uh, because of the curve of the tail. So I have to keep in mind The direction of the shape is anything changing as it moves as it moves around almost done with the technical portion and as we move to this side now this side is becoming more the further away from the light more of the quote unquote bottom of the tail so I want to get that thicker thicker line. The thick and thin helps create depth. All right, so that pretty much has the main bulk of the tail. We still have all this reflected kind of uh, highlight or shadow um, throughout the tail there. I'll probably want to do maybe some of that with the, the French curve, some of that with the, um, by just going freehand, maybe brush brush uh, pen but uh, right now we're just working on the main contours of the of the scorpion here so let's just go ahead and move into inking the man himself still using the zero eight gonna start with the main shapes and the thicker thicker lines first top of the head it's going to be closer to the light source so it's going to be a little little thinner in the line up here maybe thicker here as we move down towards the jaw because the jaw is further away so it'll be more of a illusion of a shadow You can always make lines thicker if you need to. So sometimes I'll start out a little thinner and then as I go see, ooh, you know what? We need a little more, more of a beefy line there. I will 
add, I'll build up that line, make it a little thicker as needed. But the bottom of the ear housing would be a little thinner or a little thicker. Anything towards the bottom of the shape is going to be thicker, just kind of a loose general rule here, rule of thumb. Anything closer to the top or the light source more than likely will be a thinner line. Let's move down to his neck muscle. And then casting underneath the chin. It's going to be a be more of a larger black area. Bottom of the Adam's apple. This is that shadow where the neck muscles kind of connect here in between the clavicle. Just going to keep all these different shapes in mind. Like the neck muscle here is one, it's kind of like a little rope shape. These are all the muscles are kind of like intertwining ropes. So I, I'm going to keep each shape in mind and what is the top, and that's quote, end quote, air quotes here, top and bottom of the shape. Still like to have some nice thick lines for the outer contour, which is the kind of the, the line that runs along the outside of him. Uh, not that I, I, I just do a, a one line all the way around the outside. That's not my, necessarily my style. Some artists do do that, uh, which is totally cool. Just not really the way I work, at least at this time. My style may evolve and change, and I start to incorporate that as I try new things, but uh, not really my, my approach just, just yet. Um, so... Uh, None of the, I'm not speaking to a hard, fast rule necessarily. Now I am kind of working with some of the, um, that kind of metallic reflective sort of shapes as I ink here because some of them are so tied to the shape of the muscle grouping. I kind of can't help but want to kind of fill that in. So like this clavicle muscle, I'm, uh, or clavicle bone here, I'm making almost the same thickness as I would the outer contour. It's like an inner contour of the top of the whole pectoral muscle shape itself. But maybe then this reflected line, maybe just a few little smaller, thinner lines just to um, show the difference there. And though, even though technically this would be the bottom of this shape, it's Kind of now I'm breaking uh, breaking a rule here uh, because it's not as pronounced of a shape like say the ta the tail is here or his jawline. It's more of a subtle shape. So I kind of have to over the course of just experimenting, I've learned uh, what what shapes are like the main shapes and what are shapes that are almost like a secondary shape. So uh, what, is, what do I find pleasing to my eye as far as what am I trying to make into, pop into the foreground, middle ground, background, even as something as subtle? I mean, like his head is technically the foreground, his neck is technically the middle ground, and his shoulders here would technically be the background, all in one character here, as opposed to he is in the foreground, I could draw something in the middle ground, I could draw something way in the background. So there's different levels of foreground, middle ground, background. Um, that one could perceive, if that makes sense. So it's uh, just kind of the experimentation of, of, of that, or just the, yeah, the, the perception. We'll fill that part in black a little bit later. So it's, uh, so a lot of it is decision making and what is going to make the character stand out or what, 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 what are the, the lines going to convey to the, to the reader to create the shapes necessary that makes the, um, 
the whole image kind of come together. You don't want the lines to blur or muddy too much. And muddy, mean, I mean, um, like if, all, if I did thick lines for the entire thing, for every aspect, the same level of thick line everywhere, it would be, there wouldn't be anything for the eye to play with, so the eye would just blur all the lines together and it would look muddied is, is kind of how I mean there. Or even if it prints, uh, if lines are too close together, though printing has gotten really great now that we can really do lush illustrations to where uh, the lines don't, when they go to print they up and they shrink down, they don't all just kind of close up. Um, like see, have, I have multiple lines right there. Uh, if that was too, too small, too tight, and it shrinks down, it could all blur together and, and end up looking like a muddied mess. Uh, but now printing can handle uh, a lot of dots per inch, so um, you can we can have a little bit more freedom than some of the artists back in like the olden days when printing was done with cameras and uh, not like computer publishing, where you can you know we scan these images in and uh, a, they print from a computer file, which allows us so many more options and opportunities for the, the artwork lines and colors. So now I'm just working my way here into the arm, just hitting the, for the most part, the main, the main shapes, the bicep, tricep, etc. kind of playing with the um, that reflected metallic look that we're going for, for the scorpion's armor. I do have this shadow of the uh, of the stinger overlapping his arm here, so I, in my sketch line work I I indicated a kind of a subtle shadow kind of reflecting over the arm there. Bottom of the elbow going to be a thicker line, pulling down to a thicker line, bottom of forearm. We have a lot of dark area here for his gloves, which is a different texture than the banded metal body and arms and legs. So we have two different uh, kind of material textures we'll be working with. Kind of still playing. Can't help but want to play with the uh, the the shine here. So I'm just going to just go for it. If I'm feeling it, let's just ride that train. So as I probably mentioned in my pencil video, which I did a few weeks ago, um, I, I'm pretty sure I probably mentioned that the the the. The, the armor part of his body is going to be is trying to convey more of a, a metallic look, so it's reflecting the world around him. So all these dark parts is like the horizon, the ground being reflected to some degree. Um, if we if you um, like research like chrome and look at photos of chrome, you'll see kind of how it reflects, uh, or any other type of metal as well. Uh, Chrome is just probably the easiest one to to just check out. Um, you'll see how it reflects things. You can actually probably make out shapes and objects in in the reflection. 
And we're not necessarily looking to make out shapes or ref, uh, objects in the reflection. Um, this may be not that reflective of a surface, but it's just kind of conveying a, a metallic vibe is what I'm looking for. Um, so mostly towards the bottom of the shapes are gonna, re I'm reflecting the, the ground around him, the environment around him. And then the upper parts or the bigger open parts are reflecting more of what would be the open sky uh, type area. And it helps me convey the form and mass of the shape. Striations of the shoulder muscles pulling into the biceps there. So what's going on there? So so think about that when you're when you're doing your metallic shapes, or if it's non-metallic, even like when we get here into his gloves. As you can see, how I pencil, there's the open area, is the light. The darker area there is the shadow. Um, it's helping me convey that three-dimensional sort of vibe. I try to keep the uh, lines a bit more organic. Now this part here is actually the reflection, the whole bicep falls on the other side of his hand there. So I have to remember that, keep that in mind in how I portray that shape. Because otherwise it'll look like he has a very thin, smaller bicep than his other, other arm. And uh, I don't want that inconsistency. Let's see, got some of these inner, and, the, and again with like the, how I mentioned the muscles being like a, a series of ropes intertwining, definitely with the forearms there. I think more so than any other part of the body. All right, let's move into inking his hands and forearms now, since they're more in the foreground. I like to ink things that are in the foreground as much as possible so that uh, the stuff that falls behind it, it's easier to uh, make sure the lines fit where they need to be and, and uh, I don't accidentally ink something that goes beh behind the arm. I, I take the line too long and it's now it's cutting over into his fingers or something. That looks kind of weird and it's like, ah, uh, looks like a mistake. Because technically, I guess it would be a mistake. So I'm trying to think foreground to background as much as possible. Not a hard, fast rule that it always has to be done that way. It's just kind of a an approach I, I often maintain um, a majority of the time. Like I said, not a hard, fast rule, not all the time, but just it's easier for me to do that a majority of the time. Sometimes I get a little distracted or I get so excited about what I'm going to be drawing or inking next. I kind of jump to that, that, that new shape or that new object and kind of abandon <laughs> where I was. And uh, if I forget to go back to it, sometimes I have these gaps in the art where it's like, oh, like sometimes I'll, I'll go into scan and realize, oh my gosh, I totally forgot to ink that side of his finger. How did I miss that? I go back, ink it, then rescan. It doesn't happen all the time. It's actually pretty rare, but it's not unheard of. Oftentimes I'll catch it before I go to scan, but I'll have inked almost the whole thing and realize, oh my gosh, there's a whole section there. 
I forgot to come back to. So the backs of his hands are turned away from the light source, so they're going to have more darker shapes to convey that shadow, and that also gives us a little bit more depth. A few little wrinkles there around the, the wrists from where the gloves kind of bunch a little bit. some of these twisty turny forearm muscles. Oftentimes I'll put a little X inside that's to remind myself to fill that place in with black. Especially if it's a larger chunker shape it's easier to wait and do that with a brush rather than take my my pen and just sit here and fill it in. It's going to put too much wear and tear on my on my micron that is unnecessary. It would shorten the life of my micron. So right job right tool for the right job, I guess is the situation there. Now we'll work on this other hand. Considering each finger as its own shape, its own entity, and the lines, the thick and thick, thick and thin lines for each knuckle, each part of each digit, is uh, something I'm thinking about all the time as I as I draw, so that everything gets its own, I guess, level of attention. Uh, and there's no wasted effort or, or uh, or what's the word I'm looking for? I guess so the point I'm trying to make is I don't want it to look like I just uh, gave up on drawing a certain aspect of the scorpion here. Like, oh, it's really exciting to do the face and the tail and the muscles, but the abs are kind of hard, so I'm just going to kind of gloss over that. Um, it's, that vibe is going to come through to your viewer if it, if it looks too uh, abandoned. Um, sometimes it's those difficult parts that need more attention so that you can, so that we, myself included, can level up that, that, that problem area. And there was a time where abs really were uh, a problem area for me. And I had to keep studying and practicing and trying and figuring out my approach to those shapes. And I continue to study and try new things and, and let my work evolve um, by um, just continual study and practice so that it doesn't stagnate for me, so I don't get bored with my drawing because I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. If I try something new, it's challenging my brain. Like, you know, playing a video game. If, you played, if we just played Pac-Man all the time, only Pac-Man, now, Pac-Man's a great game, but if that was the only game you played, unless you were just super passionate about Pac-Man, which some people are, and that's totally awesome, but me, not so much. I need to play Dig Dug. I need to play Burger Time. I need to play Galaga. I need to mix it up for myself. I need to try new games. Now, of course, I'm talking all like 80s pizza joint arcade games. I guess that was the height of my gamer days as a, as a kid. Uh, don't really play a lot of video games now just because I'm drawing too much. I just love drawing, so drawing's kind of my video game. And drawing can be your video game, you know? It's like, so we, we practice new things, we try new things. We uh, Drawing abs was a boss that I had to beat, you know? I had to learn the trick to beat that boss. And then, I, you know, I, I learn new tricks about new things, or, you know, it's just like, that's been, I try to make that my approach to things. It's like, what is the, 
What is the difficult area in art for me? That is the boss that I now have to figure out how to beat. What are the, how do I need to discover my shapes? You know, what is my what is my move that I need to do to um, to figure out how to uh, Sorry, gang, my T-square was wanting to slide down my drafting table. <laughs> Did not want that in the shot. Um, another one of my drafting tools, the T-square. Hopefully you have a T-square. Young artists, if not, ask for it for your birthday or for Christmas. If you can't afford to buy one on your own. They're not too expensive. But a T-square and a triangle, really important for drawing backgrounds and panel borders and stuff. Uh, so, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, the boss. Beat the boss level up, try new things, and, and it keeps it kind of fun and exciting uh, in, in my art. It's not always easy, but trying new things and challenges, of course, is not going to always be easy. In fact, most of the time it will not be easy because that's why it is called a challenge. Uh, if it were not a challenge, then it would just be called, I don't know, uh, what would the opposite of that be? A cakewalk? I don't know. Thinking and talking and, and drawing at the same time, sometimes my brain locks up. <laughs> uh, man. But hopefully you get the point of what I'm trying to say is, is uh, don't be afraid to accept the challenges and push through the challenges um, because that's where the growth will come and the leveling up will come. Whether it's trying something new or pushing through the the challenging part of something that you're already used to doing, but not quite getting it the way you want. All right, so we're making some pretty good time here. This will go to color. I will be doing a color video for this. Thank you for everyone who commented on the pencil version saying that y'all did want to see the inks and the colors. More than likely this will be Copic marker colors uh, unless I decide last minute to do watercolor but right now I plan on doing Copic marker just because the sketch covers seem to respond better to um, the marker for me than, uh, than the uh, watercolor. Not to say watercolor is impossible or not doable, it's just the water, if I use too much water it really makes this sketch cover cardstock buckle more than, actually though that now that I feel it that's a really thick cardstock it's really good um, so who knows but more than likely I'll use uh, Copic markers because I have a lot of cool greens uh, that I'd like to to bust out and uh, color uh, scorpion with all right so now we're doing his trunks here going to be a it's a, similar to his gloves similar material we'll be coming in with the brush pen momentarily to fill in all these black areas which is like I said a lot easier on the microns but even here with the whole underpants area Keeping in mind the shapes of the thighs connecting to the midsection and uh, all these shapes here, how do I want to convey that shadow and reflected light so we can put a darker shade of green inside there. Um, now we work on the thighs and we will be getting to his face here, gang. I do need to get to his face. We have to finish all the banded metal, but... Uh, Right now I'm still working on these big shapes and some of the ref most of the reflections of the metal here in his body.
Now for this other thigh, which is coming towards us. So it's a little bit bigger shapes, thicker shapes, thicker lines. The lines not only cr can create shadow, but create depth. And in that regards of creating depth is we want the thicker line to uh, convey foreground. So things with a thicker line can look more like it's in the foreground and the thinner line uh, can give the illusion of recessing into the background. So even though we have some aspects of the knee here that are definitely way further in the foreground, it's the, the, the detail of the inner parts of the thigh here and we don't want everything to be a big thick, sh big thick line, big thick shape. So, um, or shape of the line is what I mean there. The shape is going to be bigger and thicker, like the thigh muscles and stuff. Uh, but the the lines, we don't, don't necessarily need every line to be a a larger, thicker shape. For me, more, more often than not, it's the contour, which is that line that goes around the perimeter of the scorpion, as well as certain aspects inside like this chunk of the thigh muscle right here, or maybe, you know, certain parts of the knee or the, the quad here. So it's all kind of the choices that need to be made and a lot of that has come from the study of real life as well as some of what have my favorite artists done the ones who have influenced me or inspired me all right so that takes care of the main body parts. Now let's uh, let's go ahead and move into that face. We've been leaving it uninked for quite some time now. Let's uh, let's zoom that in a little bit more. So you can really see the detail as we go. All right, so I'm gonna still use my 08 micron for the black part that goes around his eyes. Like a nice thick line so that when I go in with my brush pen, it's easier to keep all the black ink inside the line. Then we'll work on, so the head is slightly turned a little bit that way. So I keep that in mind in the, how much of the mask marking or this black marking that goes around his eyes, I should say, how much of that do we, do we see? As the head turns, parts disappear and so we see more of it on this side, less of it on that side. I'm going to power down to the zero, double zero one. I'm sorry, no, the zero one. They don't make a double zero one. That would be almost too thin. So I'll be filling in these parts with brush pen a little bit later. So let's work on his brow here. Nice thinner lines to keep things crisp and keep from being muddied. A 
the nostrils here because he's kind of got that weird nose. Work on his cheekbones and the pull of the face, the facial muscles are pulling because of his facial expression. So the, so the lines around his mouth and around the cheek and jaw are going to be, we're gonna see more of that, that striation, the pull of that muscle. And I'm gonna to switch to the 005 now for some fi even finer detail, like the pull uh, from the, the nose or nostril area for him. And the chin. Make make the, the, the face that you need to draw. Don't be afraid to do that. A lot of artists, you see, you'll see like sometimes we have mirrors at our drafting table uh, because sometimes we have to make the face that we need to draw. Now that there's a, you know, Google image search, I'll oftentimes search the, the expression I need to draw like man yelling or child crying or and I'll just look at you know photos of real life people making these expressions and study their face and how did their how did their muscles and you know teeth look their eyes and the crinkles around the eyes how did that look and how can I incorporate that into what I need to draw So sometimes I'll make the face or the pose I need to draw. Sometimes I'll look at photo reference to get that. To get that, uh, especially facial, facial feature or body language just right. Not that I have to use that exact image as my inspiration, but sometimes it's just that, just portions of it inspire me or give me the information I need and then I, from there I can make my own decisions in my art. It's like, okay, that's close enough. I can fill in the blanks for the rest of it. So still using the 005. Around the eyeballs here. Now I'm gonna power this down to the 003 for the finest detail here uh, for like the iris and the little black pupil inside. Just to keep the details really crisp and clean and easy to see, easy to differentiate. Like the eyelids here. The wrinkles around his eyes, the bottom part of the eyelid, just real fine details. If I try to do these details with the 08 micron, way too thick. It would just turn into a mess. This is the, again, that right tool at the right, for the right job sort of situation. A few more little teeth there. I'm going to go back to the 005. I'm just going to do a little, some little hatches here. A little cleft in the chin there. Some little fun little detail lines.
So then I got the sh more of shadow, kind of I, I broke up the line in the sketch to have, am I still in camera view? Good. To convey that shadow of his chin and jaw overlapping. Let's zoom this out just a smidge. Oops. All right, uh, so let's put some of this through the black area here. Um, didn't really pencil it in, but, and that's okay. I'm making a decision as I uh, as I ink, calling it audible, if you will. Uh, this is to kind of create a gradation from the black to the white. This uh, this kind of kind of helps create a. Essentially, these represent gray, from black to gray to white is the uh, the thinking there. Now back in the olden days, any time, any comics book, books pretty much created before 1992, 93, comics were, were not uh, colored by computer so much. So it was, if you look at an olden comic, a comic from the olden days, um, you'll notice that the colors are kind of more flat, maybe a secondary color, um, but not not they're not colored like they are now. Because now we can do with computers, it's it's like almost infinite choices. But back in the 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 times prior to computer coloring, it was sheets of film they had to cut. And then a camera would take a picture of all the greens, all the blues, all the yellows. And there's this whole halftone process and, and stuff I learned back at the Art Institute, which even at that time was becoming obsolete there in the 1990s. And, um, but, I, but I was kind of in that, that, that transition time of the old way of doing it and the new way starting to become more prevalent. But the comic book line artists because they didn't have the luxury of all sorts of lush colors, but limited color options, they would have to um, convey everything in black and white line art. There were no lush illustrations. Or not, I shouldn't say there were none. There were very few. It was pretty much black and white. And anything that needed to be gray wasn't shaded in gray like with a pencil where you could come in and just... Uh, just come in and just kind of shade this all in and make it real nice and, and fine shading. You couldn't really do that so much, uh, not on a regular basis for most of the comic books be coming out at that time. So they had, the, the inker would take the penciler's art and, and convey any gray area into a black and white line. So that's where all this cross hatching comes in. It's like, oh, this is gray? Well, how do I make that gray look black and white so the camera that would take the photo of the artwork for print would only see black and white so they'd have to create you know uh, 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 an illusion of gray and so cross hatching was the 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 way to go for a vast majority of uh black and white line art and then then they would do the color so this would be all you know, his whole body would be one shade of green, and then his gloves and trunks here would be maybe a slightly darker shade of green. And that was it. That was all we got for the scorpion. It was green and a little bit of a darker green, and he's done. Now you can go with all different sorts of shades of green, some yellows, you know, whatever the computer can essentially color. So uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so th that's the thought behind the... Uh, the... Uh, kind of cross-hatching nature. And we still do it because, one, it's fun to see just in the line art. Um, a lot of young artists 
coming up nowadays are have much more open artwork, which is awesome and amazing. Some are still very highly detailed, highly rendered, um, which is awesome and amazing. And that's what I like about comics is that you can have all sorts of different styles from really open artwork to highly detailed artwork and everything in between. Hi hyper realistic artwork to hyper cartoony artwork uh, styles. And that's so much fun. That's why I love comic books so much is that there's such a, a wide variety of styles and uh, approaches to how to draw and or color the comic. Um, and it's gives me lots of different flavors. I like lots of different flavors, not just one flavor all the time. Um, I like to see all sorts of things, different styles. I am a fan of all sorts of different styles of, of comic book artwork. Either I learn from it, I'm inspired by it, or it's just fun, just plain out, flat out fun to look at. So I'm just putting some of that cross hatching here through different parts of his body. And keep in mind, one thing I'm keeping in mind is the, the shape. So the, the shoulder muscle here is, as I've indicated with the banded metal lines, which we're about to ink, the, the, the curvature of these cross hatching lines are gonna go in that same direction. I want the, 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 the cross hatching to conform in the direction of the shape of the muscle. to help create that roundedness. If I just did it flat, it would flatten out the character. Pulling around the uh, that forearm muscle, I want it to give the sense of shape. So I'm thinking about the directionality of these, these um, cross-hatching lines. That, that is very important. It's not just lines you just, just slap down anywhere. Give them rhyme and reason and they will look like they belong, and it won't. It'll give your character more mass and shape and and volume on the page, and that's what helps make it look super super cool. Uh, and if your characters are looking flat, it could be maybe the 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 cross hatching lines are being uh, laid down in a flat manner. But like, are, are we paying attention to the directionality of the lines and what those those lines? need to achieve. And a lot of that can come with, you know, continued practice, trial and error. All right, so let's now ink the, um, and I was using a 01 if I didn't mention that for all these cross hatching lines. So let's now put in the banded metal that I need to finish out the, the reflective metal here of the tail. So I'm gonna start here at the neck Definitely do not want to use my 08 micron because again, that line, that, that nib would give me a line that's too thick and it would overpower the shapes of his body. And that's not what I'm looking for. The different uh, line weights and variations gives the viewer eye uh, more to play with and it helps them to see what is most important. The banded metal is a nice detail, but what's most important is just the mass of the character. So that's first and foremost, get those muscles in nice and big and chunky, and then come in with these finer details like this banded metal, and that's like icing on the cake. That's my approach. If I came in and I made these, I wish I could uh, demonstrate that what, by using the 08 micron, but then we'd be stuck with a big thick line I don't want on there. So we just have to imagine if this was a big, if these these lines were as thick as like these these lines here, oh my gosh, muddy, muddy mess. Everything would look, and it also look really flat. That would flatten out the character as well. I'm curving these banded metal lines around to keep in mind the 
I'm keeping in mind, I should say, the shape of the, the arm. I want, it, I want it to give that roundedness to the, to the to arm, the forearm, the upper arm. I don't want it, I don't want to flatten my character out. So I'm keeping in mind that full shape of the of the arm. Same thing with the legs here. I want that that massive volume. And that's going to come with this detail line. It's really going to help convey that information. So I have to be very thoughtful, or as thoughtful as possible, about where am I placing that line. And it's best for me to figure that out in the pencil stage as much as possible. So that when I go into the inking stage, I already know, okay, I've figured out my shape. I, I know the volume that I'm gonna be working with here. So I can ink it with as much confidence as I can, knowing that I'm not going to flatten the character out. That's the, that's the probably the a big takeaway here from the thinking video is not flattening our characters out. And let's go ahead and add the banded metal to the tail. And this is a challenge, as I did in the video, or is the maintaining the directionality because it's coming up and then it's curving over and then coming down. So I want the curves of the bands to help convey that direction to the viewer. I don't want to switch the curve um, and create the wrong direction. That would again flatten things out. Something would seem like, wait, what's going this direction? But now those curves make it look like it's going the other direction, but it can't go the other direction based on what's being established here. So, all right, so not much more here left to do. I do want to uh, put in the um, reflected shapes. So for part of this, I'm going to use the French curve again and just pull, pull these lines through. So mostly on the bottom side is where I'm going to have the darker shape, the thicker lines. Breaking up to a thinner line. As, it, as they separate there. Continue this on through here. Because it's such a tight area, I probably didn't, I didn't need the, to use the French curve. Probably be just as well to do it freehand. In fact, maybe I will do a little bit of that freehand because it's such a small space. Just feather it out like that. But then maybe for a section like over here, since it's such a clear place, go back to the French curve. So we got thicker here at the base as it, it, it falls behind his shoulder and then it, it thins out in sort of that chrome sort of pattern. I could even put in a little bit more of a, as I indicated here in my pencils, a little bit of the, sh the shadow cast from being behind the shoulder. 
oops, that was off camera, but I just added a little, some little bloops, some of those organic shapes. I like this a little bit at the top, like that. And now I've come over to this shape here. I had mentioned I was going to try some of my uh, brush, brush pens, my zebra brush pen, because I wanted to get some really nice organic shapes. So I'm using the medium uh, brush pen here. The more I, I press down, the thicker the line, the less I press down, the thinner the line. So I just want to get some nice organic shapes going in here to create a thicker chunk. To the uh, shape of this uh, this portion of his tail, uh, I did did I did indicate a fade here, so like this part and this part will be filled in black here in a moment. But what I wanted to do was uh, work with this fade here, and I want to have a nice consistent because uh, I mean we can do all sorts of fade textures, but in 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 this case here, I want a nice clean fade, so I'm going to use my French Curve and my 08 Micron, and I'm starting thick, pressing down more, and then and loosening up, lightening up, I should say, as I, as I uh, come to the outside here. So it's going from that black, it's going from dark to light, and then just moving the French Curve just a little to create that fade. We'll do the same on this side. So, and I, sometimes I'll go from light and then I press down more as we move towards the dark area. It's another approach I do. So I can go two directions to get the, to get the fade. All right, so um, now what I wanna do is just give that a moment to dry but what I want to do before I go in with my brush pen to fill in all the black areas, I like to then erase. I like to erase before I fill in the black areas because otherwise there's a, it lessens my chance of smudging when I go to erase. If I have a big black area and I go to erase, too many times this happened where it's like, oh, it wasn't quite dry and I just have a black smear go up and across the, uh, the art and that's so disappointing. So lesson learned after many years of doing this, erase first then fill in the black. It just makes life a lot easier. I'm using a kneaded art gum eraser here. I find that um, it doesn't pull up the, the line art as much. I know a lot of young artists have asked me about or have mentioned that when they go to erase, the, the black lines fade too much after the erasing, which can happen oftentimes, especially when I use like a block eraser, which I still will use sometimes. But for that initial, gotta get the, the bulk of the line off, a kneaded art gum eraser, I find, doesn't pull up the, the, the ink line so much. It doesn't cause the ink line to fade quite so much. Not erasing that just yet. I'm still waiting for that to dry. Because I put an X there, even though I'm erasing, it, it doesn't... It doesn't take away, it, it helps me remember, like I have to remember to fill in those parts black because I did not put the X there. So that's, that's a risk of, of forgetting, me forgetting to do something. And could I end up forgetting to spot the black there? It's a great chance of that happening. I do it all the time. I was scanning in some pages of a comic that I'm working on and I noticed uh, a certain shoulder that has, or a shoulder that was supposed to have a certain amount of black in it was not filled in. I saw a little spot that had an X in it like that and I was like, oh boy, forgot to fill that in with black. Fortunately, I could do that digitally. Then I just had to remember to go back and just do the same to the original art. But, uh, So some areas where the uh, needed art gum eraser won't pull up the the, pens, the graphite, I then bring in the, the block eraser, this being the Statler Mars block eraser. I'm 
Now this is safe, dry enough, and safe enough for me to erase over. Sometimes I'll use my little pen click eraser. I used it in the pencil video, the Enoch eraser. All right, I think I got most of the, uh, the graphite off of the sketch cover. So now, what we do next here is uh, bring in the po Pentel Pocket Brush Pen. And now we can fill in those areas that are supposed to be all black with black ink. And this is such a fun part for me because it really Oops, almost had him off screen there. Um, it really brings so much shape to life. It's like, it's like the eye gets, now it gets to, to dance between the positive and negative space. Negative space being like the big white areas the lines and the black chunks are the positive space, essentially. So I just go through here and just, I like to hit these sections because I'm right-handed, I like to work from left to right, so there's less of a chance of my hand dragging across an area of wet ink and causing a smear. I like to work from top to bottom, left to right, because I'm right-handed. I hate when I drag my hand through wet ink and smudge and smear. Really appreciate y'all hanging out with me and thanks for watching uh, this video. If you like this video, could you please give me a thumbs up if you liked it? That really helps out a lot. If you have a comment, please feel free to put a comment in the in the uh, comment section. I, I do appreciate your, your comments as well. I do read them. Sometimes I'm able to respond, but I do at the very least read them. I do appreciate that. And uh, sharing my video is a great way to support my, my channel. So feel free to share this to your social media accounts if you think other people might like to see this if you have any comic book friends who who like this sort of stuff or if you know of any aspiring artists that might get some uh, good tips from my from this video a share really does go a long way. I do appreciate that. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on future art videos. Still working some pretty heavy deadlines, so I try, I'm try. i gonna try to post it as regularly as I can. Uh, I know it hasn't been as much lately because I've just been doing a lot, a lot of work. Um, and those comic book projects will be announced, the most recent one announced being my Thor one-shot comic coming out this uh, June 29th called Thor Lightning and Lament. Um, so, uh, and that's written by legendary Marvel writer slash editor um, Ralph Macchio. Ralph, not the Karate Kid, Macchio. Um, I grew up reading comic books he worked on and uh, 
and he was definitely known for his work on Thor as well as Spider-Man and stuff. And I remember reading his comics that had his name in it. And, I, and this was back in, when I was a kid in the 80s. And it's like, wait, Ralph Macchio, the Karate Kid? No, no. It's two guys with the same name, essentially. S spelled different, spelled the same way, pronounced differently. There's Ralph Macchio, the Karate Kid. And then Ralph Macchio, the uh, Marvel writer, editor. But even back then it was like, wait, what? The Karate Kid makes comics? All right, just adding a few little details there. And oh, Got my little cover signature here. This is how I put my name on all the covers that I draw for Marvel and DC and other companies. There we go. And that is, let's zoom out here a little bit more. That is the scorpion. Just put them like there at an angle. Thanks again for watching. Hope you had fun. Thanks for all of your support. And I'll be back with the uh, color video here, hopefully sooner than later. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And if you're uh, wanting to follow me on any of my social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all those links are in the video description below. Feel free to, to give them a check out and uh, follow me on other social media so you don't miss out on any of my comic book project uh, announcements or artwork that I post throughout the, throughout the days, months, years. So <laughs> that's about it, gang. I'm Todd Knock. Keep on drawing. Keep having fun.